enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, I'm Dr. Dennis Lambridge, for those of you who have not met. I'm uh, the political science program coordinator, and every year uh, we work together to have some discussion of the Constitution and why it's important to us. So the Constitution was signed on September 17th of 1787, and then each year colleges and universities around the country celebrate Constitution Week. Although the events vary, they all celebrate our Constitution and its impact on the American way of life. And as part of our activities this week, tomorrow and Thursday at the Bell Tower, we'll be hosting a voter registration drive. You can stop and register to vote if you're not registered in South Carolina. And we also have information on absentee balloting for other states that will be available. So we'll be out there tomorrow from 11 to 12, and then on Thursday from 12 to 1, made by the Bell Tower. One of the major debates during the Constitutional Convention was the relationship between the states and the national government. The first 10 amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, were added as an extra layer of protection for citizens against dominance by a strong central government. One of the driving forces behind the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War. In many ways, this debate has continued throughout our history. Today, we're discussing the First Amendment's guarantee of the right of free speech. Social media, citizen journalists, and immediate access, combined with relatively few checks on the reliability the veracity of the information being disseminated, makes this an even more important freedom that we need to protect. Confucius is credited with saying, learning without reflection is a waste, reflection without learning is dangerous. As consumers of information, with its ever-increasing availability from a number of sources, we should adopt an attitude that reminds us that acceptance without reflection is dangerous. We have also become a very polarized nation. Social discourse and polite conversation are being replaced by a shouting match, as though volume is all that is needed to silence those of opposing viewpoints. The college campus, once the site of vocal protest, debate, and discussion between and among students and faculty, is much different today. Discussion and dialogue are often replaced by refusal to listen to those with a different opinion. Rather than address the issues being raised, the character of the speaker is often attacked. When that fails, the interchange devolves into a cacophony, just noise. Most, if not all, attempts to speak end up being over, under, or around whoever else is trying to speak, especially if they have a different opinion. Rather than intellectual exchange, the attitude among many is, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind is made up. That's why we come to college, to learn. Tonight's speaker is Mr. Chad Jenkins. Chad is a proud graduate of Newberry College, class of 1996. I was accused earlier, I said 1966, <coughs> but then it's 1996. Uh, there may even be a few professors in attendance tonight that taught Chad while he was here. He received his JD from the University of South Carolina. Chad is a partner with the Pope, Parker, and Jenkins law firm. His primary interests of practice include criminal offense, family court matters, and personal injury worker com compensation cases. He recently obtained a sizable verdict for a local business and a workers' compensation insurance coverage dispute after the case was appealed all the way to the Supreme Court. He has assisted workers' compensation clients in obtaining the care and benefits they are entitled as a thriving criminal defense practice and regularly they handle felony and misdemeanor cases, including DUI and other traffic-related matters. He serves as a presenter at continuing legal education seminar on criminal trials in South Carolina and at seminars for magistrate <coughs> judges. He's taken courses, become certified in standardized field sobriety test and data master, and continues to law learn law enforcement's latest technologies, including drug recognition evaluations. Lifelong learning is a test. Chad recently presented on defending a breath test case at the South Carolina Association of the Criminal Justice Defense Lawyers Seminar. He also presented sec seminars on sexual crimes and regularly serves as an instructor at magistrate training seminars. His goal is to be the most informed person in the room about the latest trends in criminal procedure. During college and law school, he served as an office courier and law clerk at Pope Hudgens, which is a predecessor of his current firm. After serving a judicial clerkship at South Carolina Circuit Court, he returned to Pope and Hudgens to practice law in, 20, in the year 2000. A Union South Carolina native, Chad and his wife, Melanie, 
are members of Central United Methodist Church and the Carolinian Society. She had served as an adjunct professor of constitutional law here at Newberry College in 2016. And he served on the Newberry Downtown Development Association Board. He previously served on local YMCA Board of Directors and coached the local high school mock trial team. He enjoys hunting and bicycling. And in our conversations about this, we found he had a passion for the First Amendment <laughs> and challenges to free speech, and we figured that fit in perfectly. So after this formal presentation, we'll have time for questions on issues related to the topic. So how about joining me in welcoming Mr. Chad Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I won't call out the professors that taught me here, but uh, the, uh, I think it was his first year as a professor at Newberry College, uh, my senior year, so he's not a whole lot older than me. Uh, I'm not going to say anything else about Ringer over here because we don't know how old he is. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I don't think I know any of the students out here, which is a good thing as you can tell by what I do for a living. I do a lot of criminal defense work, so I do meet a lot of students, but I don't see anybody here that I would know by name, so that's probably good for you all. Uh, nobody wants to have to come see me. If you come see me, you've probably had a bad day. Um, avoid that. Try not to see me. I hope this is the only time you see me in your four years here at Newberry, unless it's at some social event. Here to talk a little bit about free speech. Uh, I've got a PowerPoint. It's just some slides, and it's really to keep me going more than anything. Uh, the, it's going to be more talking than the slides, uh, it really, and I hope to have some back and forth um, at the end of this. Um, even sometimes before, even before that, uh, if you have something, uh, be glad to talk about it as I go through the presentation. Um, so look forward to talking about this. Free speech. Uh, you hear people say it all the time. Uh, you see it on Facebook pages. I had someone, uh, went back through some of my old Facebook uh, posts where I'd post something to try to poke people or prod people a little bit on the, some issue of politics or uh, some current event and somebody says something and I said, no, you're not going to do that on my page. Go somewhere else. Or you're violating my right to free speech. No, I'm not. Not in any way, shape, or form. You don't have a right to free speech. Not on my page. The only thing free speech applies to is the government. And even if you have a right to say it out loud, it very seldom is truly free. And so, is it worth it? What's the price of free speech? Anybody got a number they want to put on it? What's free speech worth? I can tell you one person who knows. Alex Jones. The price for his free speech was $45.2 million in punitive damages. We're going to come back to Alex Jones a little bit. I don't know if anybody subscribes or listens to InfoWars or Alex Jones. Um, but he made a lot of comments about the Sandy Hook uh, school shooting, uh, the massacre, and Cost him $45.2 million in a jury verdict. Free speech certainly wasn't free for him. He had the right to say it. And as he talked about, he had the platform. He had the biggest megaphone because he's got a large following and lots of money. So he can say it and people listen. But it wasn't free for him. It very seldom is. And not just always monetarily. First Amendment. I'm going to do a little bit of a primer course here. Uh, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. I left the press part in here. Uh, there's some other things. You've got freedom of religion, uh, freedom of assembly. We're not going to deal with those today. It's, uh, I'm not going to keep you here till midnight talking about those things. Um, I say everybody, look, oh, God, please don't keep me here till midnight. Uh, leave those for another day. Uh, I did leave the press part in there because the press is a loose definition. Back in... 1791, when the First Amendment was ratified, you had to have a building, a printing press, ink, paper. You printed it, printed it up, literally, on a piece of paper and handed it out. Books, pamphlets. That's not the case these days. Um, you hardly ever even see newspapers these days. You may see them in the store. You could buy one if you want. used to be you got one delivered to your house every day. I got a state newspaper delivered to my dorm room every day while I was at Newberry College. I'm old, but I'm not that old. It hadn't been that long ago that I literally got a state newspaper at my door every day. I don't know if the state publishes 
a tenth of what they used to publish in actual newspapers because it's all online. It's easy. It's easy to access. It's easier to read. You got your iPad, you got your phone, you got your computer, you got whatever you need to go read it. But even more so than that, all you really need is a phone that you can probably get for free, a Twitter account, which is free, and a free Wi-Fi. Go down to the local coffee shop. Newberry College has free Wi-Fi all over the place. You've got that. Guess what you've got? An audience. You are now the press. You now can disseminate information to other people. And that's what the press is. Now, the press used to have standards that they'd go by. Even the written press these days, who knows what those standards are. The standards seem to be who can sell the most ads or get the most ad clicks or who can sell the most papers. That's what they're interested in. But some of these individuals that come up with these followings, Alex Jones, uh, whoever, and I'm just using him because it's somebody we're going to talk about, all you need is a free account and some people that are willing to listen, and you are now the press. So I left the press in there. Uh, it costs you literally zero dollars to be the press these days. You don't need a printing press. The First Amendment only applies to the government. Keep that in mind. Uh, like I said, Facebook, Twitter, we'll get into some of those. My Facebook page, I don't have to allow you a voice. Mute, delete, unfriend, whatever I want to do. Twitter, mute, delete, unfriend. I don't have to allow you to comment or even have an opinion on anything that I say. I usually do because I'm always up for a lively debate. Unless somebody's just being outright horrible to other people. That's the only rule I have, golden rule. If you follow the golden rule, you're good. Other than that, I'll let you say what you want to say on my page. I don't care. I'm up for the debate. It's what I do for a living. I'm fine with that. But you don't have to. You don't have to listen to anybody. There are things that are not covered under the First Amendment other than non-government speech, uh, non-government censorship of speech. You've got obscenity, fighting words, defamation, child pornography, perjury, blackmail, incitement to lawless action, true threats, and solicit solicitation to commit crimes. Those things are not covered by way of either case law or the Constitution itself and the Bill of Rights. Those things are not covered. What we're really going to be dealing with, though, here is defamation uh, and uh, incitement to lawless action. That's some other things that we'll talk about a little bit when we're talking about uh, Trump's ban from Twitter and why they said they banned him. Uh, those things are simply not covered. Defamation is an important one, though, because that's the one that will cost you the $45.2 million. Talk about a few recent cases. Um, this part, just to throw out some examples of recent uh, examples that the Supreme Court has taken up in regards to freedom of speech. You've got Federal Election Commission versus Ted Cruz. Uh, Ted Cruz loaned his campaign $260,000, which is $10,000 over the limit set in a bipartisan election bill that said election reform bill. They said we're only going to allow you to loan your campaign $250,000 and get paid back at any point. Otherwise, anything over that has to be paid back within 20 days of the campaign. And what they were trying to do with the law is say, we don't want you to be able to go buy a senator after he got elected. He's currying favor with the senators or our congressman or president or whoever it may be. So we don't want you to be able to loan yourself a bunch of money and then get it back if you win because it's just people literally buying a senator. But the Supreme Court said, nope, not allowed. You can't limit it. And they had some good reasoning. Some I didn't agree with. But some of the good reasoning was you have some people running for office that may not have the funds, may not have the uh, campaign uh, finance that these other folks may have by way of fundraising. And if they want to loan their campaign money and get it paid back at any time, that's perfectly fine. You've got to give them that voice. you got to let them do it. Uh, Got a Barisha v. Lawson case. Don't know what happened there. They, uh, I don't know if it came back or not. I'll talk about them anyway. Uh, has anybody seen the movie or read the book War Dogs? Anybody? Y'all need to watch it. It's good. Uh, the War Dogs movie or the War Dogs book talked about a couple of kids from Miami that became gun runners uh, with the help of the Albanian Mafia. 
Uh, the book and the movie talked about the former prime minister of Albania, his son, being a part of the mafia. And he sued them. He sued the writers of the book. And this case was important because it talks about the uh, public figures. What do you have to show for a public figure to be able to sue you for defamation? You have to show actual malice. Not just that they were wrong, not just that you didn't like what they said, or not just that they absolutely were false, falsehoods about you, but that they said those things knowing that they were false and with the intention of harming you with actual malice. Um, so there's a different set of rules for public figures. If you run for office, you're a public figure, you put yourself out there for that, uh, you almost open yourself up to more criticism than, say, you or me would. Uh, got a case, uh, Mahanoy, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, so that's the school district versus BL, that's the initials. Uh, BL didn't make a team, uh, didn't make the softball team, and she was pretty upset about it. And she goes home and she gets on Snapchat and posts a Snapchat that says, F school, F softball, F cheer, F everything. This young lady was mad. She was ticked off. Well, somebody ratted her out, showed it to a coach. And the school decided, well, you can't participate in any of these events for a year. And her parents sued and said, you don't get to be her parents, we do. She's got the right to say those things outside of the school setting. The Supreme Court said, yeah, she's got the right to say those things. She can say them if she wants. May not be a good idea. Now, if she ran down the hall at school saying them and disturbing the school, it's a different event. That's inside the school. But outside the school building, you have more rights. I still don't recommend it because an employer may see it one day, and if they do, you got to deal with it. It's another part of free speech not being free. The Morse v. Frederick case, that was in 2017. Uh, this young man uh, decided that it would be a good idea to go to a school event outside of the school and hang up a sign that said, Bong Hits for Jesus. <laughs> that was pretty much the reaction that this kid got. People laughed. Yeah, you may want to explain to those people what a bong is. That's probably not familiar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they, uh, I, I, I'm going to guess they know more than we do. Uh, but regardless, Bong Hits for Jesus. Probably not the best idea, but they got the same reaction that we got here. People laughed. It wasn't a major disturbance. Nothing really happened. They suspended the kid and tried to expel him. And the Supreme Court said, no. See, if you punish him because it did cause a disturbance, because a disturbance happened, then you may be able to get by with it. But to punish him because he actually said it or printed it up on a piece of paper and hung it up, well, nope, you're not allowed to do that his right to free speech. So you can say bong hits for Jesus at a public school. That's something you're allowed to do. It's a good idea, probably not, but, and it's not always free. Like I said, it comes with consequences, but those consequences can't be from the government. Free market consequences are always okay. Government consequences are not. Um, here's where we'll get to some examples for discussion. This is part I hope you all help participate. Alex Jones, does anybody listen to him? Anybody know who he is? other than through the news on Sandy Hook, um, InfoWars. He's got a show that's undoubtedly extremely popular. I'm going to be honest, I've never heard it, never seen it, never watched it. Uh, it's an internet-based show. Um, I don't think it's even on TV anymore. It may have been at one point <clears throat> um, on some alternate channel. And like many people on the internet, many people on the TV today, he made a living just being as wild and as crazy as he could be with his statements. Conspiracy theories, <clears throat> I mean, just wacko stuff. And one of them was that the Sandy Hook shooting, where kids were actually massacred in their school, was a fake. Uh, it was false. It didn't really happen. That somebody set it up so that they could argue and try to use it to enact gun control. And he actually called the parents of these students who had appeared on TV uh, talking about their kids who had died. Called them uh, cri fake crisis actors. Accused them of being liars. That's what he accused them of. These parents got threats and other stuff from some of his crazy followers. Uh, sorry if it offends you if I call Alex Jones crazy, but that's opinion and 
that's covered under the First Amendment, and he's a public figure, so I feel pretty safe that he won't be able to sue me for defamation because he is, in fact, crazy. Alex Jones said repeatedly, crisis actors, these people aren't even real. Their kids didn't die. They sued him for defamation, for intentional infliction of emotional distress. And this would have been a great First Amendment case, but what you got to understand is it never turned into the First Amendment case because Alex Jones wouldn't participate in discovery. He wouldn't give them his emails. He wouldn't give them stuff that they asked for, which you're allowed to do in civil cases. And so therefore, the judge held him in default, which means he was automatically guilty of what they accused him of. And the trial was literally only about how much it was going to cost him. That's what that trial was about. So it was a very limited trial. Uh, he's tried to make it outside in the hallway, outside the courtroom about his First Amendment rights, saying that you want people to be able to question the government's version of events. That's true. I agree with him on that. You want people to be able to question those things. Having an opinion, saying that the government set this up, he probably could have got by with it. When it crossed the line was when he pointed at someone and said, this person's lying. This person is acting. It's a fake. That's actionable. That is defamation, the true definition of defamation, and therefore he can be sued for it. Can he say it? Absolutely. Nobody can stop him from saying it. The government can't step in and say, you can't say that. Remember, only applies to the government. The government can't pull him off the air and say, he can't say that. He can't question us. He can't question these people. But it still isn't free because it cost him something. $45.2 million. Um, who's Newberry's biggest rival these days? Back when I was in school, it was PC. Is it still PC? And I don't even know if they play PC anymore. Um, Lenore Ryan. Okay, I'll give you an example. Uh, Lenore Ryan sucks. That is an opinion, and I can say that. And I don't feel in danger at all of getting sued. That's an opinion. Now, if I step over a line and say, all Lenore Ryan students kill puppies on the weekend, I just accuse them of being puppy-killing criminals. That's actionable. I just defamed every student at Lenore Ryan. If I said, Lenore Ryan's football coach um, has sex with goats on the weekend, guess what? I just defamed that guy and I can be sued. There's a line there. You have to stay on the side of opinion and not on accusatory false statements. False statements against people are not covered under the First Amendment, no matter who says them or where they say them. Talk about Twitter. Uh, I think Twitter's getting old. I think it's Snapchat and TikTok now, which I don't do either one of those. But you know, Twitter's still uh, relatively popular even amongst uh, the younger folks. And so therefore, it's a true place for public discussion. Still a pretty toxic place. Um, Elon Musk says they need to go back to where they used to be. Uh, back before uh, 2000, I think it was 17, prior to the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally where the guy ran through the crowd and run over the girl and killed her. Uh, you saw the guys walking through with their uh, tiki torches lit up and uh, Unite the Right rally. That's what it was. After that rally, after that death, Twitter really cracked down. Uh, they banned the American Nazi Party and some other white supremacist groups from being on Twitter. They just said, nope, you can't do it anymore. And Elon Musk says, I want to buy Twitter because it needs to go back to what it was before. And what it was before was just wide open, almost like the government. The government can't stop the American Nazi Party from saying whatever they want to say. They can't stop a white supremacist from saying whatever vile statement they want to say. They can't stop anybody from saying anything. The government can't stop you unless it falls within the obscenity incitement to violence, those few narrow constrictions. Other than that, the government can't do it. Guess what? Twitter can. But before 2017, it had become almost an uninhabitable place. Uh, Twitter was not somewhere you could go. You'd go, but then every statement, no matter what it was, would get shouted down with just vileness. Um, and people started not using it. 
Twitter made a decision, which is what almost all companies base their decisions on. You might know what that is. There you go. <laughs> the, uh, um, that, that's, that's the driving force behind any business decision, money. They decided that their audience would be bitter, bigger and stay bigger if they'd ban white supremacists in the American Nazi party. Seemed to have made a pretty good decision for them business-wise. Free speech-wise, I don't know. Um, Musk said that free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy and Twitter is the digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated. He's right on that. Twitter, other social media these days, but Twitter especially seems to be one of the most utilized areas for people to discuss current events. And it's important, it can be really important. Uh, anybody remember the Arab Spring, uh, what it was and what happened? Uh, you had Egypt, uh, Yemen, uh, several other Arab countries that had uprisings. Uh, leaders were overthrown. You had civil wars. You had just unrest. And it all started on Twitter. If Twitter had shut down those conversations, which they had a right to do, those things may have never have happened. Some of those countries never go through the reform that they went through. They never got the new leader that their people undoubtedly wanted. Twitter was very important to that, so it does play an important part. It is sort of the town square, but it's a town square that's owned by a corporation who has shareholders, and those shareholders in that corporation are interested in one thing. It is not your right to free speech. It is not whether they offend somebody or don't offend somebody. It's not whether a Democrat or a Republican wins office. They've got one overriding factor every time. That's money. Free speech may be costly to them. Therefore, they can restrict it. Restricting it may cost them money, but it's a decision that they've made based upon what they think is going to make them the most money. That's how corporations work. That's how businesses work. Uh, Twitter shut down a lot of accounts over vaccine misinformation. People saying the vaccine had a tracker chip or something in it uh, that you, know, you should take some horse dewormer instead of the vaccine because it was safer and uh, the vaccine was, you know, uh, it all blew my mind, uh, but some people believed it. And as he talked about, there's no check on the truthfulness. There's no check on the quality of the information that you're receiving. You are the check. You have a right to, and you have a duty to, in my opinion, monitor free speech and determine whether it holds any value whatsoever. A um, couple other examples. Facebook. Facebook policy prohibits hate speech and attacks, violent or dehumanizing speech, harmful stereotypes, statements of inferiority, expressions of contempt. Uh, that's a short part of some of their guidelines, policies and procedures. Um, COVID misinformation, that was another one where they shut down a lot of sites or you'd see a post but it'd have a little white out over it with a little thing saying this has been shown to be false please click here for better information and they would you know basically censor that information some of that information turned out to be true later on was it right for them to do so they have the absolute right to do it but whether it was the correct thing to do is always up for debate but you know how that gets handled same way as everything else in the free market system People quit using it if they disagree with it. People quit using it, they lose money. They lose money, they stop doing whatever it was that caused them to lose money. They'll come back to whatever makes them money. That's what they do. Uh, election misinformation, uh, you saw a lot of that. Uh, funny thing is, you heard recently, uh, Hunter Biden's laptop, uh, Zuckerberg went on, uh, the Joe Rogan podcast and was talking about it and said uh, they didn't specifically say don't print this stuff but two or three weeks before the election uh, that hey FBI came to him said look Facebook y'all need to watch out for election misinformation be careful what you print we don't want you to print things that may not be true because it could affect the election and Zuckerberg said we we put that Hunter Biden laptop story in that little pocket and we put it to the side 
and we made it where it, you could still see it sometimes, but it wasn't as uh, up front as it normally would have been. Was that the right decision? At the time, they thought it was, for whatever reason, probably more because of money than anything else, but they thought it was the right decision. Come to find out, most of that story was true. They did find Hunter Biden's laptop, and it did have a bunch of compromising information on it for Hunter Biden. So a lot of it was true, but they didn't allow it to be as readily absorbed by their users as they would other stories because they'd been warned about election information, misinformation. Uh, something recent, the, uh, these are more uh, what I call self-enforcing uh, issues. Uh, I saw this pop up on my news feed the other day, the Rocky Mountain Vibes minor league team out in Colorado Springs, Colorado. They had a family night planned and when they found out that a group called <clears throat> the Storks Pro-Life Group, uh, the Storks Pro-Life Group, that was the name of the group, was participating in their family night, they canceled family night. They didn't want them participating. Now, is that a good decision? I don't know. I can tell you, if it happened at the Greenville Drive, where Bob Jones University is a driving force in their politics in Greenville County, That'd probably be a bad decision for them to make. Colorado Springs, eh, they're a little further to the left. Probably wasn't a bad decision for them. It's all about dollars and all about public perception and what they think is going to benefit them as a company, as a team, as a money-making organization. Uh, the free market's going to take care of it, though. They're going to find out that violating free speech or free speech, their freedom to... Uh, tell those people you can't come use our ballpark as a, a soundboard for your ideas. Doesn't come free. Comes with consequences. Those consequences may be that they get more people in their stands. May be that half the people that would have come watch their ball games don't watch them anymore. Whatever the case may be, they have to live with that. But the free market is going to take care of them. Uh, other one I saw: Dominion uh, voting systems versus Fox News. Fox News was one of the major uh, news organizations, uh, them and I think the Newsmax, uh, OAN, a uh, couple of the other fringe ones, but Fox was one of the major ones that repeatedly, their hosts were repeatedly saying Dominion systems were faulty, they could easily be hacked, that they had been hacked, that they were switching votes from Trump to Biden, and they were just blowing up the news waves. Uh, judge Janine, you notice I used the quotes around Judge. Uh, she was one of the main players. Hannity, Tucker Carlson, all of them were screaming about Dominion and somehow found Dominion to be a scapegoat for whatever grievances they thought they had with the election. Fox News is about to find out. They had the right to say it. The government couldn't shut them down from saying it. Nobody could tell them they couldn't. They own the news. They own the news. They can publish what they want. They have the freedom to say it. But they're about to learn that freedom of speech ain't free. There's a $1.6 billion lawsuit pending against them right now. Dominion Systems says, you defamed us, you said false things, and that those false things have hurt our business to the tune of $1.6 billion. My guess is Fox is about to find out. Free speech is not free. Very seldom is. We've got the other part of this, it's uh, wokeness. I hate that word, but I used it here. Council culture, I hate that word too. But part of it's true. People are scared to speak up. People are scared to say things that may be somewhat inflammatory. People are scared to speak their mind sometime. It's self-censorship. Uh, you see it, sort of a mob mentality sometimes on social media. Uh, you say something on Facebook and then you've immediately got 20 people uh, calling you a name, uh, whether it be, you know, homophobic, racist, you know, whatever. And it shuts people down. It makes them scared to present their opinions. Uh, scared to say what you think. Now, is that bad? That's what I'd like to talk about a little bit because quite honestly, I don't know that it is. Uh, if you're scared that it's going to cause you some type of harm because people are going to consider you to be uh, 
racist or homophobic or uh, whatever that you don't want to be considered, you may want to rethink saying it at all. It may not be a good thing to say because it may be homophobic. It may be racist. It may be anti-Christian. It may be anti-Jewish. It may be anti-Arabic. It may be whatever. Think about it before you say it. I think it's made people think about the consequences of their actions a little bit more, which I think is a good thing. Uh, I always tell people the best advice I ever got when I left home to come to Newberry College. Uh, my mom always told me, said, hey, I know you're a college kid. I know you're going to do what you're going to do. Go have fun. But before you do anything, I want you to think about what's the worst possible outcome. And if you're willing to accept that worst possible outcome, have at it. If you're not, you may want to back up and think about it a little bit. It's the same thing with what comes out of your mouth. If you want to say whatever you want to say, spit it out. But what are the consequences of that? Because while you may have the right to say it, and the government may not be able to prevent you from saying it, it's very seldom going to be free. It's going to come at a price, and is that price worth it? I think that's how we do self-regulate ourselves. Uh, and I think that's a good thing in most cases. But that's up for debate. Be glad to hear anything, take any questions, uh, anything anybody might say. Yes, ma'am. Um, what responsibility does the speaker have for the actions of those who listen? It depends on the type of speech. Uh, there are some speeches that are meant to rile people up into violence. Uh, there are speeches that um, are, that's their sole intent. Uh, to uh, get a crowd riled up, to get a crowd whipped up, and to incite violence, uh, to encourage violence. Um, in those situations, uh, they may have some responsibility for it, both morally and uh, it, it comes with consequences, whether it's, I don't think the government can tell you you can't say it, but it's going to come with consequences. Those consequences may be even criminal charges. Uh, you know, there's things you can't say. I can't holler fire in a crowded theater because it may cause a rush for the door and somebody may get hurt. That's not protected speech. The government can say you can't do that. They can make it illegal to do that. Uh, the government can make a lot of things illegal uh, speech-wise that can cause harm. That's a fine line uh, because I may give a speech uh, intended to uh, rile people up but not necessarily intend them to go out and uh, cause violence or mayhem um, and if they do so that, that's on them to me. Uh, I very seldom would hold the speaker uh, responsible, never hold them solely responsible, uh, but I have a hard time holding a speaker responsible for what their subjects do. Uh, I am, for whatever other uh, thoughts I may have, I am pretty much a uh, man of, uh, you're responsible for your actions and uh, just because you listen to someone, that's, that's probably your fault, uh, your fault more than others. And it goes to what he said about not being able to have fact checkers and stuff do the job for you. Do it your damn self. It's hard. I don't know if I can say that here or not. Do it yourself. <laughs> they, uh, um, I say a lot worse most of the time, but do it yourself. Fact check. Go read the actual document. Don't read the summation given to you by CNN or NBC or Fox News or OAN or whoever the heck you may be watching or listening to. Do some work on your own. Go look at it. Go read the actual bill that they're debating in Congress. Even though the congressman may not have read it, you go read it. Call your congressman and say, that's crap. Did you read it? The answer is probably going to be no. They don't read half of what's put in front of them. They get some intern to do a summary for them. Or they rely upon somebody else to tell them what's in it. Somebody puts a bill that thick on your desk two hours before you vote on it. Guess what? You hadn't read it. You don't know what's in it. If it's 20 times that size, you don't know what's in it either. Same thing with your news. I get a little thing that pops up. I've got, if you looked at my browser history, you'd be like, good God, what does this guy read? I read everything. I've got bookmarks for Fox News. I've got bookmarks for BBC. I've got bookmarks for Al Jazeera, NBC, CNN, you name it. I read all kind of news sources because I think it's good to say, okay, what's the other side saying about this? And it's bad that the news has a side, but they all do these days because they're all about selling 
ad clicks. That's what they're about. But what bo it bothers me, and it has ever since it started popping up on CNN. When you open up the CNN page, if you try to click on an article, it pops up. Do you want us to present to you the top five stories of the day summarized? In other words, we're going to summarize it and tell you what's important. Hell no, I don't want you to do anything for me. I want to do it myself. And that's what you need to be doing. That's what everybody needs to be doing. Take some responsibility for your actions. Take some responsibility for what goes in your noggin as far as news is concerned. I think that's important that you do so. Thank you for that question. Please have some more. Yes, sir. Say that again. I'm, I apologize. What point does privatized companies like Twitter and Instagram and whatnot too much power over censorship of people? Okay. Um, I don't know if y'all could all hear that. Uh, at what point do companies uh, like Twitter or somebody have too much power over censorship, over what's being said? Um, I, I'm a free market person uh, in most cases, not unfettered free market, but I am for mostly a free market where companies can decide and let the people decide whether that company's doing the right thing or not. Um, you know, recently companies have started being a little more socially aware. Some people say they're being woke. I don't think it's a bad thing to be woke. I think it's a good thing to have some social awareness about what is going on in the world and how what you're doing may affect the world. I think Twitter, I think Facebook, I think most of those companies have some social awareness, and I think they're trying. I don't think they prefer one party or the other. Uh, I think they are trying to limit just complete misinformation. Now, is that their job? That's a debate that you know, I can't answer, but I can tell you that the government has no right and no duty to limit that company. The government... I don't even know why they're holding hearings and dragging Zuckerberg in and whoever the Twitter executive. I don't know why they're dragging them in because they have really no control over these companies as to what they do or don't do in regards to misinformation or limiting information. Right. And so at what point is it like, if you get banned on Twitter, and then because you're banned on Twitter, you get banned on a different, totally different app because of that. When should the government, or should the government ever step into situations like that? My opinion, no. Uh, that the government should not tell Twitter what to do. Uh, let the market handle Twitter. Um, if Twitter starts just banning people willy-nilly and say, okay, I'm going to ban you because we don't like what you say, we're going to be... We're going to ban anybody that's conservative. Or we're going to ban anybody that's considered liberal. If they go either way, they just lost half of their audience. They're not going to do it. If they lose half their audience, they just lost half of their value. Their stockholders are going to raise Cain. That's how that gets handled. I don't think Congress, I don't think the government has any business regulating Twitter or Facebook. I think they don't get to get into it at all. They don't get to tell the newspaper what to publish. They don't get to tell Twitter who to allow or not to allow. And there's no right for me or you or Donald Trump or Alex Jones or anybody to be on Twitter. Twitter's a service that they provide for free. And they don't have a duty or an obligation to provide that platform for us. They could shut down tomorrow and put everybody off Twitter. Or they can stay open and allow as many people as they want or cut off as many people as they want. But they're going to do it based upon a business decision. Um, you notice, I mean, I always told people, you know, if, if you don't like what Twitter's doing, open up your own new, new, new version. Uh, and there's, I don't know, what's it called? Uh, there's another one now that Trump started. Uh, what, Truth. Truth Social. Uh, you know, if you don't like what Twitter's doing, go to Truth Social. See if you like it there. See which one you like best. Uh, you know, that's how the free market, that's how the system works. Sort of like Fox, CNN, NBC, whatever. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we should tell them what to say or not to say. Uh, now, whether they should be 
allowed some of the protections that n legitimate news organizations are allowed, uh, that may not be the case in some of these situations. Um, some of them are not what I would consider legitimate news sources because it's literally opinion all day long. That's not what news is. News is, here's what happened, here's what's going on. But to be honest, it's our fault. It's our fault that the news stations are what they are. Every news station that remained relatively neutral, that remained a true news outlet and not just an opinion factory catering to the right or to the left. I did that backwards. To the right or to the left. Every one of those outlets, they saw their market share drop, drop, drop. Fox went up. MSNBC went up. Yeah. You got to be on one side or the other or your market share drops. If you're in the middle and just trying to present the news, your market share is dropping. And why is that? Because your eyes are not on it. You're not clicking. You're not going to their site. You're not watching their news program. It's our fault. We've become entertainment instead of news, and we want entertainment. By God, we want entertainment, and we want people to tell us what we already believe. We want somebody to reaffirm whatever opinion we already have. And by doing that, you end up with news organizations that aren't very newsworthy. That's what you end up with. You end up with news organizations that are catering and trying to feed what you already believe so that you'll keep watching, so that they can make more money. And that's on us because we could stop that real quick. Quit watching them. They'd quit doing it. Most of it boils down to, we've got to be better. I don't expect any of anybody to be better other than me. If we are, they probably will be too, because it'll hit them in the pocketbook. And that's the only thing they truly care about. Thank you. Any other questions? Discussion? Anybody disagree with me? Come on, let's, somebody, let's fight about it. <laughs> they, uh, yes, sir. Yes, you have a right to lie. You can say lies all day long. Now, if you say lies about me, that's a defamation. Uh, I can sue you for that. But what if I said something like, I can't believe Chad would have stolen all that money? I can sue you. Why? I didn't say you did it. I said I can't believe you would do it. If the statement is taken as you believed it, that'd be up for a jury to decide. I'd be glad to take that statement in front of a jury and sue you over it. Uh, because I believe that a jury would side with me and say, yes, that statement was defamatory. You were trying to defame Chad. You were trying to accuse him of a crime. And if you accuse me of a crime that I didn't commit, that's defamation. Uh, that, that's absolutely actionable. If that was written and you didn't hear him say it that way, if he's saying just the words, I can't believe Chad had stolen all that money, then it's not defaming you at all. Support it may not be defaming me. It may be supporting me. It depends on the context. Um, you yeah, know, there's a lot of context there, but, um, but you can state falsehoods. I can lie. I can walk here and say, you know, uh, Newberry College is an Ivy League school. Should be, by the way. But I can say that. It's not true, but who did I defame? Who was harmed by that statement? Nobody, so I'm not getting sued over it. I can walk outside and lie and say the sky is purple. It's not. I didn't harm anybody by saying it, though. Harm anybody by saying it. Now, if I say, you are a thief and a liar, he can sue me. That's actionable. I just defamed his character, and I may have caused him damages. I caused him damages per se because I accused him of uh, being dishonest or accused him of a crime. He's entitled to at least a dollar. <laughs> um, how much is up to a jury somewhere? Fox News may learn that it's worth a billion dollars or so. Uh, because they defamed a company that lost a lot of business because of their defamation. Uh, that's when you start running into problems. If someone accused me of being uh, dishonest, of stealing from my clients, that's one of the worst things an attorney can do. It's one of the quickest ways to get your bar license yanked off the wall. Steal money from your clients. If you do that, you're going to lose your law license, okay? You do that, if somebody accused me of that and I didn't do it, guess what? I can sue them because they probably cost me business. They probably caused people not to come hire me that would have come and hired me otherwise. Uh, 
if I accuse a professor uh, of some horrible act against a student and he lost his job, that's defamation. If it didn't happen, it's defamation. Now, truth is always a defense to defamation. So uh, if it's true, uh, then you're free to say it anyway. But if it's not true, I just opened myself up to a lawsuit because he got fired because I accused him of something that wasn't true. That's always a possibility. But you can lie, but you can't lie about a person or accuse them of something defamatory. A jury decides if, uh, if it gets that far. Um, it, during, during the yes, I mean, you know, and if, if I say that, uh, come up with a good example here. Um, if I say, you're an idiot, okay? That's an opinion, and it's hard to prove one way or the other. It's up for coin flip, you know, who, who knows? Um, I'm assuming you're not. You know more about computers and running a camera than I do, so you, you know, there's a lot of areas that you're not. Uh, it, you may be in another area, uh, but that's not necessarily defamatory. If I am, if you are suing me for defamation, you have to prove that you are not an idiot. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe take an IQ test. I don't know. That, you know, that, that's a that's not the best example, but you know, you can a uh, you can say bad things about people if they're true or if it's just an opinion uh, and if it doesn't cause damages. Me calling you an idiot really doesn't cause you any damages. You're not going to get fired. Nobody here is going to pay me any attention. Uh, if you're a public figure, I can call you an idiot all day. You're opening yourself up if you're a public figure. If you run for politics, you open yourself up for whatever comes, quite honestly. Uh, unless they literally accuse you of you know, some criminal act, uh, and it's really hard to prove damages uh, because you know most people don't like politicians anyway, so it's hard to defame one. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, but yeah, it, it's hard to prove it if you're a public figure. But if you're not a public figure, people should stick to the truth about you. Um, they can state opinions. Uh, somebody could state an opinion that I'm a bad lawyer. They can say that. I would never sue anybody for saying it. I'd tell them they were wrong, but I couldn't sue them for saying it. I wouldn't sue them for saying it because one, it's probably not going to harm my business much, if any. It'd be hard to prove that it did. And two, it's hard to prove whether I'm good or bad. That's a subjective opinion. If they say I, you know, somehow neglected my client because I did A, B, and C, and none of that is actually true specifics, then, yeah, I can sue them for defamation. So there's lots of, you know, there's lots of little things when you get into defamation about uh, whether it, is actionable or not, uh, whether it caused any damages and those kind of things, but um, it makes you think twice before you say it, uh, and it should. Um, so should the court of public opinion. It should make you think twice about whether you want to say what you're thinking. By nature of debate, you know, we've got a few minutes left, but by nature of debate, your comment about self-censorship. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, they're going to say what you're saying. I need to consider whether I should. They were a private institution. Uh, they still don't allow any homosexuality at all. If you, I mean, you, I guess you could be homosexual, but you better stay in the damn closet because if you don't, you're out of Bob Jones. That's their rules. And they can because they're not a government school. They can do those things. They're a Southern Baptist school. That's who they are. Uh, should they be able to? Yeah. They should be able to do whatever they want to do. If they want to prohibit interracial dating, let them have at it. Let them go up to their little enclave and do whatever they want to do. Anybody that feels differently should never apply there. I certainly wouldn't. And if I got accepted, I'd laugh and say, how did y'all get my application? Because I never sent it. You know, I've got choices. They've got choices. Their choices are, here's who we want to be. They're allowed to be whatever they want to be because they're a private institution. Now, if it were Clemson, South Carolina, you know, College of Charleston, all those are state-supported schools, they can't do those things because they are government schools. And there's a lot of things that they can't violate that private schools can. Yes, sir? If it's a private school that gets uh, government funding, <coughs>
Some, yes. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a gray line, and where that line falls is not always determined with 100% accuracy. Uh, uh, for instance, Newberry, I know, gets uh, public money through you know, grants and different scholarships, lottery money and all those things. Um, they're, they're not completely without some restraint, but they are not treated the same as, say, South Carolina or Clemson would be uh, because they're public schools versus private schools. Um, and, you know, privately held, and I mean, you know, Newberry's a Lutheran college. I, I think when I was here, the Lutheran uh, portion of the budget was tiny, tiny, tiny compared to um, everything else. So it's, you know, how much control does the Lutheran church have? Uh, but the same thing with the government. The more money you get from the government and the more government funded you are, the less control you have over what you can and can't do as far as some of those restrictions. Um, and some things still apply. I mean, you can't just willy-nilly violate you know, every constitutional right a student may have just because you're a private school. Uh, but you can um, do a lot more than a public institution could. That's also interesting because it's currently going on in New York City, the Hasidic Jews' private schools getting millions and millions of dollars of federal funds. Right. And not being held accountable to the same extent. Well, and our Supreme Court just said it was okay. Uh, that um, I think it was, it was a Connecticut, uh, it may not have been a Connecticut. Maine. Is just a Maine. Connecticut. Um, where, yeah, there's areas where there are no public schools within, you know, uh, 100 miles. Um, that, that's pretty wide open. There's probably some places like that out west. Uh, we think we're in the country in Newberry. You ought to head out to some places where there's not anything for hundreds of miles. Those, the Supreme Court ruling on that said that if you're going to provide parents with funds, to attend another school because there's not a public school nearby, you have to allow them to use it at whatever school they choose, including a church-affiliated school. Um, so the separation of church and state doesn't apply there, uh, is basically what the Supreme Court said. Did you have a question? play the nasty role of being time keeper, and I know students have other things going on. So we said the late o'clock, it's been a great discussion. So Absolutely. first round of applause. <laughs> and so there are a couple things. One, the, this last question raises a whole another interesting set of issues about free speech within an academic environment, both from a student perspective and from a faculty perspective. And that might be a great topic for another special discussion because there are all kinds of very unique aspects of that that definitely apply that are kind of outside the scope of this broader discussion. But I think we may want to consider having that debate. Would you be willing to? Okay, and so we'll try to think about setting that up as a smaller subset because interesting issues for all of us, students and faculty in a private setting. So again, thank you all for coming tonight. Hope it's been a worthwhile and educational experience for you. Uh, for those of you that are in my classes, I have sign-up sheets out front. Make sure you sign those uh, to get credit for here. And if you're supposed to be getting credit for another class and you don't see a sign-up sheet, I have some blank paper. And if you just sign that and tell me what professor you have, I'll make sure they get that information tomorrow as well. So again, thank you all very much for being here. Have a great evening. And... <laughs>